Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Ben Rogers. Welcome to this, our first uh, public webinar uh, of the year and the launch of our London College of Food report. We're very pleased to have you all here uh, today. Um, for those of you who don't know about Centre for London, we are London's dedicated think tank. We're a charity. We develop new solutions to London's critical problems. And we do that through research, through events, through convening and influencing. Um, this is a very special uh, event for me personally. Um, I'm leaving Centre for London uh, uh, end of next week. So this is my last uh, public event after having worked uh, and founded Centre for London um, ten, 10 years ago. Um, it's also a special uh, event for me because uh, this project is particularly dear to my heart. Um, I, I have three children. I do love them all equally. They will say I don't, but I do. But I, I must confess to having one or two favorite projects at Centre for London. I, I hope that's allowed. Um, and one of them is our, uh, is, 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 is this food project. It's sort of begun about five years ago um, with an essay I wrote in London Essays, just drawing attention to the sort of rather striking contrast between our uh, arts, London's great arts, design, fashion, photography colleges, um, which attract students from around the world um, and you know, establish London as perhaps the leading, leading city when it comes to our education and um, our culinary colleges, which just despite their longevity and the great work that goes on in them, don't quite have the standing of our arts colleges. I'm um, not quite sure why that is, but I don't think it serves London well. Um, yes, we've got or had before COVID a roaring food trade. Um, the food scene in London had been transformed, but we were relying almost completely on uh, foreign born chefs and our um, catering schools were actually struggling to attract and retain uh, talent. Um, and, uh, and we know there's all sorts of problems with, with the sort of um, you know, the profile of chefs in London, mainly men, ma mainly white. Um, so we wanted to look really at how we could really transform the, the quality and the standing of culinary education in London. And that was the purpose of this project. And we came up quite early on with an idea of a sort of new college for food. So we wanted to explore how that would work, who, 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 who it would work for um, and, and how we could and how it might be funded. So as I today, that is the, that is the um, the focus. Of course, when we began the project, it was long before uh, coronavirus. I think when I wrote the essay, it was even before Brexit. Uh, I think Brexit and coronavirus have sort of transformed the context, but not fundamentally changed the need for, for, for a new college. Uh, Brexit, of course, is going to make it even harder to recruit uh, chefs from Europe. Um, while um, coronavirus has clearly, you know, had a drastic, um, very damaging effect on London's uh, restaurants, ho hotels, catering businesses, uh, I think they will bounce back and all the evidence Hello, everyone. Uh, it seems that we've lost Ben momentarily. So um, I think he was about to say uh, that he's optimistic that hospitality is going to, to bounce back, but it will certainly need, uh, it's better if you can see me, um, it will certainly need um, a strong skills offer to support it. Um, and so um, here's um, how today is going to run. Um, my colleague Mario, one of the co-authors of the report, is going to give a, a presentation of about 10 minutes on the report's findings. And uh, we'll then have a, a panel discussion for which I hope Ben is going to come back. I think he just has um, a laptop issue. Uh, and then Ben will be um, kind of chairing, chairing our, um, our panel. We have a great, a great list of speakers for, for you today. 
So uh, without further ado, um, Mario, if you're if you're ready to present, uh, I'm going to pass things on to you. Great, thank you very much. So my name is Mario, and I'm one of the co-authors of the report alongside Nico Bassetti and Claire Harding. So today I'll be painting a picture of, oh, sorry, of how the culinary industry works and our case for reform. Uh, the options that the London College of Food could take, as well as our recommendations for what it could look like, followed by the plan for action. So just to give a bit of background on what the culinary training looks like. So there are many ways that chefs and food artisans learn their trade. So it's possible to walk into a professional kitchen and obtain a job as a prep cook and progress very quickly. But while a strong element of practical learning is essential to becoming a cook, there are drawbacks to learning it all on the job. Recruits are often thrown in at the deep end and without much preparation, um, they end up leaving. London's cookery schools were created to, to ready cooks for the city's prestigious restaurants and hotels. So they have a very long history. Today, cookery schools are part of the further education colleges. So 16 colleges offer cookery courses in London at the moment. There are also universities with degrees in food science and some schools have remained independent. For example, Le Cordon Bleu. However, they don't benefit from public funds and learners have to bear the full costs of the courses, which usually start at around 20,000 pounds for a one year full-time course. And these are mostly taken up by international students. Lastly, apprenticeships offer a formal framework for on-the-job training, and many are funded by the apprenticeship levy, which was introduced in 2017, though the reform is still yet to increase the take-up. So despite all of this, our current model of culinary training is facing significant challenges. Pressured by a lack of resources and the widespread perception of a cooking career as a last resort, colleges have struggled to attract and retain learners. According to government data, the number of learners who take up a course or an apprenticeship in a hospitality related subject has fallen by around a quarter since 2014. And this is despite the boom in hospitality jobs. COVID has devastated the industry in the last year. However, this isn't to say that the industry won't bounce back and outpace other sectors as it's done prior to the crisis. And as this graph shows, London employment in hospitality grew twice as fast as the London average since 1996. So as I've said, London doesn't train enough cooks and chefs locally. And this is much more concerning now as Brexit and immigration reforms are limiting the ability of businesses to recruit foreign workers. And last year we published a kitchen talent report, which also found that a vast majority, vast majority of London chefs are born abroad with around a quarter of them from EU countries. Also, despite relatively low barriers to entry and progression in terms of qualifications, professional kitchens are often very exclusive places. And for a long time, they've suffered from being male dominated as few managers make arrangements to allow for flexible working or address other forms of gender-based discrimination. And there's also strong evidence that upward mobility for black, Asian and minority ethnic Londoners is very poor. And so London largely misses out on pools of talent that represent the majority of the population. Moreover, as both climate change and healthy lifestyles have become top policy concerns, we want to ensure that the chefs have better understanding of cooking healthy and sustainable food. On top of this, although existing culinary schools have a strong vocational focus, they barely have capacity or resource for research development and innovation. And lastly, some culinary schools in comparison to the UK are actually seeing an increased demand for uh, culinary training such as a school called Ecole Farandi in Paris, who have recently doubled the size of their Anglophone courses, whilst also having to turn away 90% of their applicants on average. So it's clear that London needs a new model for culinary training so that they can rise to the challenges that I've just highlighted. And we think that one of the best ways to achieve this change is to create the London College of Food, which would be a new institution based um so a new institution dedicated to uh, culinary training and education and it could be a center of excellence for this we think that there are five strategic objectives for the london college of food which would need to be achieved and these are to nurture local talent into professional cooking and increase course take up to promote inclusivity of all people regardless of their background 
to attract investment and establish the UK as a centre for research, for food research, and to drive sustainability by improving Cook's understanding of environmental issues and solutions related to cooking and nutrition. And finally, to raise employment standards to improve overall workplace wellbeing. So our analysis, research interviews and advisory group sessions allowed us to explore a range of options that will enable us to fulfill the goals um, of uh, the College of Food. And I'll be going through this with you uh, in the next slide. So the first option is the type of course uh, which is offered in the college, which has clear trade-offs for either one. So entry level courses can be taught to a wider range of students, which would generate higher economies of scale although courses do tend to be shorter with less quality student teacher time. Whilst advanced level courses address specialist skills and are more effective in building prestige. However, specialist training skills and um, spe specialist skills training um, will exclude some students in the long run. Our second uh, trade off that we had to consider was on the status of the college and whether it should be a higher education or a further education institution. And there are two differences that impact our objectives here. The first one is how awarding powers work. So universities have more control over their course content compared to FE colleges, which will therefore take longer for higher education uh, institutions to set up and would be more costly. However, FE colleges have a shorter setup time and they have less control as they offer a wider range of qualifications and apprenticeships and assessments are determined by an external board. On top of this, the length of study is shorter compared to studying a three-year degree um, at university. The second difference we took into consideration was the cost, is the cost fees as higher education tuition fees are more costly. However, they are subsidized via loans. Whilst although in some fees and um, some fees in further education institutions could be covered by loans, for example, in career development. Despite this, they are pretty scarce. However, courses are generally shorter and are more affordable. The third trade-off we had to consider is the decision between having a standalone institution or a network of providers. The advantage of the former is that there could be an institution dedicated to the College of Food, which will give it an immediate and a strong identity and statement of intent, and will also give the institution a far more control over its operation. However, the college would likely require a new building in London, which is very costly, and in the long term would take several years to build. A network of providers, on the other hand, would ensure course availability in several locations. And there are various degrees of integrations that we looked at. The first model would involve awarding a quality mark for courses that meet the agreed standards of excellence. So the Mayor's Construction Academy is a very good example of this. The second option is a center and satellite model in which there is one center of excellence with advanced courses and a research and development center and in this case, local London colleges are the satellites who will provide the foundation courses. The final integration model could be the form of a federation in which they become a single legal entity but retain their distinct identities. So taking the University of the Arts model as an exemplar, this would allow colleges to maintain their original brand. So while there are many ways to create a successful culinary institution, we believe that very few can meet the needs of a high status but inclusive college that builds on existing providers whilst also remaining cost effective. So from the options outlined, which are also detailed further in the report, we do recommend that the College of Food should combine basic and advanced course provision to increase both learner numbers and specialized education, allowing learners to build their skills over time and also train in essential skills. We also think that the College of Food should be a further education institution in order to minimize setup time and costs. And there's still potential for it to, uh, there's still potential to create um, a world-class center of excellence um, within the framework, um, but that will require more public investment. The college should also adopt a center and satellite model of operation. And this would ensure that courses are available across London and beyond. So making it easier for local learners to access the training. At the same time, it would provide a center of excellence offering specialist and advanced training um, also offering research capacity, and it can also attract international students as well as funding in research and development. And the centre in effect would be a new institution um, with a fresh brand and a course offer, but it could also be sponsored or developed by an existing institution. 
And on top of all of this, the College of Food should also be governed by a board, which is made up of various learning providers who form part of the centre and satellite system. So the report provides an indication of costs linked to establishing and running the college based on the current system. There is a fair bit of uncertainty around these as the government is planning to publish a white paper on further education in the next couple of months. Nonetheless, we are realistic that there will need to be public investment in the development of the college uh, to make, and to make this happen, um, this could come from uh, the mayor and or national government. National colleges have set an, an inspiring precedent, um, particularly the National College for Digital Skills, um, which is located in North London. Although developing a centre for excellence um, in an existing college would help to keep costs low, especially at a time where public budgets are focused on tackling health and economic impacts of, of the pandemic. Additionally, public grants are likely to be the main source of funding, which wouldn't cover activities such as recruitment, outreach or student alumni support. And these would be key objectives for the college. So therefore, increasing income would be the top priority and the potential to do so will come from international fees, apprenticeships, research and development funds, as well as charitable donations. So what do the next steps look like? So organisations with the potential to deliver radical change to food training in the capital should come together to form a group. This group would work to showcase how a strong, uh, how a strong brand and course offer can attract learners. And they would be able to approach colleges to map out learner, journey, learner journeys uh, through food and set out the center and satellite learning model, as well as develop relationships with interested parties who can develop a formal case for investment and secure seed investment for the college. This work would especially need support and early investment from the mayor of London and or national government as well as ideally funds from trusts and foundations to contribute to set up costs and encourage colleges to participate in the College of Food course offer. A College of Food would mark the beginning of a long-term venture which could further boost London's reputation as a place to not only consume food but to learn how to create food and this would reap long-term benefits for businesses, for Londoners and for the public press and we hope that you will support the idea and make it happen. So thank you very much. And I will hand over back to Ben. Thank, thank you, Maria. That was a great presentation. I'm sorry about the slight technical hitch um, earlier on. So sort of Maria, Maria sort of indicated, we've been in a bit, bit of a journey with this project. I think initially we envisaged a sort of shiny new um, college of food that will be a sort of university level um, institution uh, and very much at a global in its scope. I think we've become increasingly persuaded of the case for making sure that it works really closely with London's vocational uh, sector. Um, and that's where the idea of a sort of satellite and, um, and, and center uh, model comes from. Uh, something which, which we hope will both have, you know, um, appeal to international students and be able to attract um, funding for research and innovation, but also um, will be able to sort of attract and, and seem accessible to um, ordinary Londoners who uh, currently you know, might consider going to an Effie college, um, uh, but perhaps you know, aren't sure where they could go next. So that, that is the plan. Anyway, we're now going to hear from our um, three uh, respondents. And we've got um, you know, three sort of rock and roll stars of the, of the culinary world um, that I'm really pleased to welcome. So Gary Hunter, who is Deputy Executive Principal of Westminster and Kingsway College and heads up all the culinary um, training uh, there. Um, and as a long-standing um, sort of leading leading figure in in the world of uh, um, kitchen skills and culinary education, Claire Pritchard, who's um, chief executive of Greenwich Cooperative Development Agency and chair of London Food Board, a fantastically significant um, organisation uh, which you know oversees um, everything that Mayor does uh, with respect to food, from food sustainability um, to, to to skills. Uh, unemployment and and beyond and, and, and Claire comes um, with a sort of fantastic pedigree of working uh, at the community level um, on food enterprise um, for well it says here for, for, for 30 years and finally uh, Asma Khan who um, I'm sure will be known to all of you founder and own the owner of Darjeeling Express uh, she's a renowned chef restaurateur and cookbook author 
um, uh, her restaurant, Darjeeling Express, in, on Covent Garden, is being extremely successful. Um, and uh, she's also very socially committed. And before the coronavirus crisis on Sundays, when the restaurant uh, was closed, asthma would um, offer it the, the premises free to women um, who are aspiring chefs and restaurateurs. And she featured on Netflix Chef's Table in 2019 and is the first chef to be featured in British Vogue's list of the 25 most influential women in the year of 2020. So as I said, culinary um, rock stars. Uh, we want to engage you as well as in, in this, um, the audience. So if you've got uh, questions, you can um, ask, ask those on the Q&A function and you can uh, upvote other people's questions as well. So if you see a question like the one that you want to pose, don't just pose yours, but instead upvote um, uh, the, the first one. That way we'll know which ones people really want to pose. Um, and there's also um, a, a chat function that I think you can, um, that you can chat to each other. And you can also tweet um, about the event and ask questions uh, on Twitter. And the hashtag is College of Food. Right, we'll get through as many questions as we can uh, before 3.30. But now, Gary, over to you, your initial reactions. As someone who, who runs an existing um, uh, college, do you welcome our proposals? I, I hope you do. Uh, good afternoon, Ben, and thank you for the introduction and, uh, and welcome everybody to this presentation. Uh, this is uh, a very, very welcome uh, report. Uh, it follows on very, very neatly from the initial Kitchen Talent report in 2019. Um, and is, is a natural progression to a very uh, acute issue that we have uh, today and, and probably have been building up to now, I would suggest, uh, for a good five to ten years in the, uh, in the education sector for London, uh, for, for culinary education, but also within the, the uh, hospitality industry. And that's a, a dearth of talent coming through our doors to be trained and then going on into the industry to then you know, pursue lifelong careers within a within a real diverse industry so yes I, I i applaud the report i think there's a lot of work to do there's a lot of discussion to have um but i think this is a, this is a great start brilliant um right i think i'm just going to go and get get contributions from all three of our um our, our, our speakers and then we'll have that sort of short short discussion amongst ourselves so, so clear you know where, where does this fit into your thinking and the mayor's thinking about the future of food in our capital Ben, yeah, thank you. And thank you very much for inviting us to be here. And also I just want to say how much I've enjoyed the journey because I think I remember the first conversation with Rosie Boycott about that report many when she, she was my predecessor as chair. And I've really enjoyed the journey and the discussion. And, and as much as I've been involved for a long time, 30 years, the learning and thinking about the breadth of this and what it's trying to, what we're trying to address and how we ensure we address that with um, considering equalities and diversity and the issues the industry's faced. And it's incredibly complex. So um, we've had a strategy around food in, in London for over 10 years, and it's very much been a strategy that, that was saying, how can we assure the food available for Londoners is healthy and sustainable? That's always been the core of that. And, and we've always had a, that, that is something that this report raises and suggests needs to be addressed absolutely 100% more than ever, you know, before, but um, but but in addition to that, it's um, food. The food industry is is employs nearly one in ten people in London. It's our biggest industry. It's responsible for a third of our carbon um, kind of output from London. So, how we teach people, how we train people, how we engage people in those businesses, and and we do it in an integrated way is a real challenge. And what I really like about this proposal and this report is it's trying to take all of those things on. And, and food is complex and cross-cutting. And typically, it's very difficult to bet people to see it in that way. And what I, what I think is really important about culinary skills and food businesses particularly is how much of that that they attempt to address. And what we've seen during the pandemic is how many food businesses are thinking about food aid and think about employment and thinking about qualities and thinking about community. And that is typical of their nature. So how do we ensure that we think about that in terms of the, the whole training and, and, and um, kind of deliver uh, training of chefs? And I think the other kind of tension that we have is we have a doubling of food businesses being registered at the moment during COVID, a 200% increase in the registration of food businesses. How do we connect that growth in street, amazing culinary street food with the training offer? And it, I think it's bringing all those things together. And that's what I really like about this model. 
Sorry, too too long an answer, but no, no. Very, I mean, I just had to pick you up on that extraordinary statistic about uh, do you say a two hundred percent increase in, in in new food businesses. So, what, yeah. I mean, can you give us a sort of flavour of the sort of businesses that are coming forward? So, lots of home based ready meals, food businesses, um, and I tell you where we're seeing real growth is meals for particularly dietary requirements. Um, um, so meals for dietary requirements, meals for gyms, we've had loads of those, but the massive expansion of meals for people that are exercising or particularly trying to follow particular diets, home-based food businesses. So what's really interesting about this, and sorry, and you have to stop me, is how do we connect the people that want to do this from home that bring skills with them when they're new, say residents of Britain, or when they have these skills or they've grown up with skills? How do we turn those into the kind of skills and qualification that this college recognises? And how do we get that progression from the home through a local college? And I think it's those progression and connection routes that are essential that don't quite, they do exist in places, but they don't exist as a connected kind of map of London and that's what I really love about this proposal because I think it's trying to bring those things together which are, I see as a kind of whole food whole food system as well. Yeah so I mean I, I think that you know when you I think Maria mentioned Paris and, and France of course. Um, oh, uh, can, you, can you not hear me? We lost you for yes. one second. I don't know why this is. I don't know why I'm having such problems. Paris has great food institutions, or France does, but they're quite they're quite traditional, and they're very much geared for people at the beginning of their career, and they learn quite traditional skills. And I think if London's going to do this, it's going to do it in a London way, and that's going to be sort of a bit funky and a bit innovative, and it's going to work for a sort of really diverse, you know, because London's a diverse city, we want it to work for as diverse um, uh, a learner body as possible. A asthma, um, uh, over to you. I mean, what's your reaction to the report? No, I, I've, I've always felt there was a huge gap in, in the fact that there was no formal training. I have taken this journey. Uh, I started from my own home um, in 2012 and I, I opened a restaurant uh, in, in 2017. So in five years, I mean, I could do it on my own because I, I kind of, you know, just kind of felt my way through it. But I think it's really important that, you know, people like me who go through this kind of journey and I know a lot of people who started with me in the supper club at that time, you know, 2012, you know, there were not that many people doing supper clubs, pop-ups are very little, little known, street food wasn't so big as it is now. So it was still pretty much, you know, very scattered, but that in that scattered group, we all knew each other and there was a huge support system that we had built up. So I can, I mean, I learned a lot from people who were like me, who were going through this journey, learned from their mistakes, you know, talked to people, got a lot of support system. So I think it's really helpful to have mentors and I think that, you know, when you cannot, and it's today's kind of fractured world where you see less people, you don't actually have an opportunity to meet a lot of people. Also, if you're a certain age that you don't have people, if you haven't been to school or college in this country, you don't have friends from that time. So you're pretty much on your own. So I, I think the biggest thing that a college could do is to be that kind of mentor because there isn't a one, one hat fits all when it comes to food. And that is to do with ethnic, uh, et, you know, ethnic foods are very different. London is very different. And, you know, earlier, just before we all came online, there was this big discussion about, you know, why is it that hospitality has not been able to have a voice that we have been treated like, you know, the, the kind of the worst people, I mean, the, you know, and, you know, and it's quite obvious that, you know, virus is not spreading in, in restaurants, uh, but at homes, which is inevitable because of the kind of closed space, but yet, you know, we were targeted, but I think it really shows how poor our ability is to fight as a united group because hospitality is very fragmented. And the thing is that what a school like this would do is to give people an identity. So, you know, you know, you're an alumni of whatever, so, you know, I went to law school and when I meet people who went to law school, I'm more willing to speak to them. I, I see an identity with them, even though that person and me may never have met. We may have sat together on the tube, but we won't have met, but it gives a network. And this is what you really need because yeah. the reason why we couldn't fight the government is because we are so fractured. We are so divided. And the London is split into high-end, fine dining, you know, big boys who are, you know, alcohol lobby, and then <laughs> mums and pops restaurants and Chinatown. And really there's a huge element of racism here as well, yeah. because the person, you know, the people who got hit first, you know, when, when the virus came out in Wuhan, exactly a year ago at this time was Chinatown. Chinatown was deserted in Chinese New Year, but you didn't find any of the great and the good talking at that time. And I was the one who was speaking out a lot saying, 
this is not why, this is why we have a problem in London, that we don't see ourselves as Londoner first. You see yourself as a Chinese mom and pop restaurant, you see yourself as fine yeah. dining Michelin star. So I yeah. think that it's very important that people who come out of a place like this, they will see the links between them. This is what we really need because in hospitality today, we are not connected to yeah. each other. I we don't see ourselves as linked to each other. And I think if you look at the art schools, one of the things that they do very effectively is sort of create exactly that sort of, um, you know, almost professional group of people. And some of them have sort of become high paying, famous international artists. And some of them end up going into art school, into, into um, sec secondary schools and, and, and teaching art. But, you know, they're, they're, they're everywhere and they have a sense of being, you know, part of a sort of single, single uh, profession and, and one which I guess has got quite a lot of weight. G Gary, just some, some, some questions. Um, to you in particular. First of all, about just give us a sort of sense of who it is that's coming to your your college. You know, why why do you think you are struggling to, to, to recruit? And how how do you think we can tackle these issues of, of, of diversity? I think in the report we talk about is it 80% of chefs are are, are, are male? Um, and you know it's it's seen as a sort of white and a male profession with quite a sort of macho ethos. I mean, do you do you recognize that as well? Um, I don't recognise that in terms of our student makeup, no, because um, we have uh, approximately 50-50 when it comes to gender um, uh, balance on our, our culinary courses. Uh, we also have a really diverse makeup of students uh, being a central London college. That will always be the case. Um, so we, we have the, uh, the, the funnel, that, that progression route into the industry of a, a real diverse mix of students that are, that are going into there. Our students are, are made up of 14-year-olds uh, that will come along to us on a, our, our Chef's Academy course, uh, which is a Saturday program. And this really gives uh, you know, kids the opportunity to hop onto a, a, a quick 10-week culinary program just to try and buy, just to see what it's like. Um, and this has been a really, really good way of um, creating another progression route straight onto our professional chef's diploma. Uh, which is our three-year course for, um, for professional chefs. And at the end of that particular final, your final year, they will have also had the opportunity to specialise in their own particular um, route that they want to take, whether that's um, uh, front of house restaurant management, or whether that's uh, patisserie and confectionery or, or cuisine, they have that opportunity to, to forge their own uh, uh, way forward for their own career path. Um, we have adult students as well. We have international students. So we followed the road of uh, Le Ferrandi in Paris and have created our own international uh, culinary school. Uh, we have the Grand Escoffier Diploma named after one of our founders. And, um, and we have um, doubled our intake over the past three years. This year has seen uh, a bit of a watershed because we have no international students coming to us currently. And I dare say that's the same for most uh, international culinary schools within Europe. But um, you know, this, has been, this has been a revelation for us, an opportunity to look and see what Ferrandi do and Sunrise and, and, and other colleges and to use our model uh, to try and uh, bring a, a, an international flavor to, to what we do. Um, at the same time, we also have other areas uh, that, that we're starting to work on. So we have a, a burgeoning uh, higher education program. We've uh, started our uh, culinary medicine program two years ago uh, and have started then uh, a, a degree in culinary uh, food and nutrition. So, you know, there's, there's lots of different hybrids that have started to come off this, what's termed as a traditional culinary route that then starts to plug into many different pathways coming into this college. Um, uh, so from 14 year olds to, to, to adults, for, for career changes to professional chefs that want that next step up on the ladder. Um, you know, we, we're, we're everything to everybody. Um, and I think that's probably the key to our success. One of the things that we have managed to do at Westminster Kingsway College is to maintain our student numbers. Uh, and that's really, really crucial for us. So perhaps in, in a lot of respects, we've bucked the trend uh, being a central London institution and have managed to, to maintain our, our big numbers of students. But what we want to do is to increase those numbers of students, uh, especially where we see some colleges that are, are losing courses, some colleges uh, and universities that are walking away from vocational education at this moment in time, then where, that, where there is a gap in that market, 
we would automatically expect to see us gain in our student numbers, but we're not at the moment. And there must so, be a reason why. Just one more question for you, Gary. Can you imagine, I mean, uh, you know, you've spoken um, supportively about the proposal, but do you think you'll be able to, will be able to persuade um, other colleges in London to get behind it? Um, I see no reason why not, because I, I, I think this, uh, this hub and spoke process or this uh, centre and satellite uh, mechanism uh, that has come out of this report is refreshing. I think what it does do is it gives each college their, their autonomy, it gives them their own brand, it gives them their own identity, but it creates a, uh, a group of colleges uh, and, and people that are landed that can support each other, that can share ideas, that can, can really, really start to drive standards. And it also gives those local colleges, I, I, I was talking to, to somebody earlier today, they were talking about uh, some, some localised work they've been doing with their local college at Croydon. Um, and you know, there was some, some really, really strong work that had been done with the local communities, with the local restaurants there, to meet those localised needs. And that's something that you know, we could do at Westminster, but only within the Westminster Camden areas. And that's great because we do that. But, you know, we want to be able to support those other colleges that are doing that mm -hmm. and then to plug in uh, some new learning, some new education, some new research, uh, new ideas to, to support that, uh, that business to grow, to support uh, you know, new candidates, new students with skills into jobs to then help again, you know, to, to stimulate that economy, to stimulate the growth of that particular business Brilliant. on a local basis. Thank Sorry. you, Gary. And before, before I, I turn back to, to Claire and Asma, I should say that I gather in this type, like technical hiccup, we didn't have a chance to acknowledge and thank the, the sponsors um, of, of this report. So I'm going to do that now. So that's um, funders, the Mark Leonard Trust, the Stanley Foundation, and the Story Charitable Trust, in particular, Alistair Story from Baxter and Story. Uh, major sponsor, uh, the City of London Corporation, and supporting sponsors, Claridge's and, and Soho House. And that really nicely reflects, I think, the sort of, you know, the coalition of different sectors that we always try and build up a, a centre for London. It's also really well reflected in the audience we've got here today, which is, I, I see you've got people from the public sector, the private sector, from uh, colleges, universities, um, and, 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 and charities. So that's absolutely great. And a special mention to the City of London, who um, I should say, and they've, you know, they've asked me to mention uh, that, as I said, they're the major sponsor, um, and they've got a proud history uh, with delivery companies of providing direct education and supporting education institutions in London. Um, and as part of the city's proposal for a new co-located um, wholesale food market in Dagenham Dock in East London, uh, the city is also looking to provide a new food school that builds on the success of established practices like the Smithfield Apprenticeship Scheme and the Billingsgate Seafood Training School. And the school could be a really exciting opportunity to ensure that traders have the skills required to continue to be world class whilst developing the next generation of butchers, fishmongers um, and, and fruitiers. So, uh, we're hoping to see a new, um, a new, or at least much sort of strengthened and newly located um, food institution, uh, training institution in London, which I hope will become part of the mix and very much part of the centre and satellite um, network we're, we're trying trying to build. Claire, can I just ask you? I mean, are, are, are you hopeful that we can get the mayor? I mean, I know you can't perhaps speak. <laughs> will, you, will you will you be will you be bending his ear about about finding some 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 resource from the um the adult education budget to support well, the idea? I, I was going to say the adult education budget's really interesting because now the adult education budget sits with mayor. It partners brilliantly with uh, what Gary Gary's just described with the local colleges and local providers. So actually this morning I was teaching, I was teaching our food, uh, our business course and I teach our food business course and we also run culinary skills and, and, the, um, and it's that and, and it's that kind of real flexibility and mobility of having those small providers that link with the local college and then those pathways to colleges like Westminster for progression. And, and um, uh, I can't really speak for the mayor, and I, but I, he's very much focused on his nine missions and the impact of COVID. And I think our real concern at the moment is increase in poverty. But what I would say, if, if, and I was looking at the nine missions, which I know I should um, know off by heart, but when you look at the nine missions and what they're trying to achieve, I think this food and this contributes to lots of them. So when you think about high streets and how we revitalize high streets, hospitality and food skills is absolutely core. When we talk about young people, and I know I was looking at the chat, the barriers, the routes for how can we make the hospitality industry 
uh, attractive to young people. That's a real challenge for us. And we, um, but there are, it's such a diverse industry as Asma described, that maybe the traditional routes for young people going into the food industry need to be trained. Where is the partnership between the academics and the borough markets and young people or the, or the street trading? What, how can we get those more innovative uh, um, training and qualification and development partnerships that are appealing? So we get, you know, you say young people aren't going into the food industry, but on my food business course, I have a real diverse range of very, very young people. And it's so where are we losing them? And what is the environment and the atmosphere that is, is making that unappealing? But there's a lot of good food industry where it could be appealing. So so I think we need to ingest and the report suggests, you know, we are we paying London living wage? Are we giving people really good employment rights? It, or is it just, you know, there's those issues. So in but I think in terms of the nine missions, so I'm not going to say what the mayor, or mayor won't commit to, but I think you should continue that conversation with the skills team because there's no question that we really support this approach. I can't talk for the mayor, but from the London Food Board. But I think in terms of those recovery missions and high streets, a healthy, um, vibrant economy and things like, and the Green New Deal, I think this really, really contributes. So I think you can make a really, really good case. Yeah. I promise next time I meet with him, I'll talk to him, but I cannot <laughs> and represent the mayor. But I think there's a case and I think the adult learning team in the, in the GLA are very, very interested. Yeah. And we, and need course, on this call. we need to engage central government as well. We, we tried very hard to get a minister, but, but, but we couldn't, but we will be lobbying. Can I just say one thing, though? I think I think where there is an opportunity with London is that London has um, been prepared to take steps around food, but no one else in the world has. So we had our advertising ban. We're putting in our um, planning restrictions around catering. We're doing radical things. We've had a food strategy before there was a national food strategy. So I think London is a place that we could say, let's ask London to rise to this challenge and let's la ask London. And I think there would be people that would be really willing to yeah. hear and listen and do what they can to support them. One of the best statistics that really sort of struck me from the first report we did was, was if you look at, um, uh, you ask young teenagers or kids, kids at around sort of 10, I think it was, what do they want to do uh, when they grow up? Being a chef is really high up there. It's sort of top yeah. 10 at least, you know, and I recognize that from my own kids. Um, you know, I had a boy at 10, definitely wanted to be a chef. He's now 15, he's got no interest in it and, and, and it completely falls off, you know, and it's, it's not aspirational. I do think, you know, creating a sort of world-class college of food um, in London, uh, which is cool, could really, could really help with that. I mean, it's a long-term project, but it could help. But Asma, there's, there's, I mean, there's a question here about how do we increase um, interest in, 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 in you know, studying, uh, catering, cooking, um, the culinary arts, uh, and you know who's it appealing to now, and how can we how can we change that? And I suppose another question, which is just you know what do you think excellence looks like in in culinary education today? I mean, is it you know when how do you? Well, I think that. Go ahead. Sorry. We have we have one issue. Why uh, your earlier point about children losing interest? The media plays a very big role. Because the only time that you actually see what's happening inside a kitchen, because most people don't, people like you and me, everyone has seen what happens inside a kitchen, is when you see shows on television on prime time, you see a heavily tattooed, usually white man shouting uh, at, at, his, uh, at his team. And this aggressive, obnoxious behavior, comments carried in the press where, you know, you have very prominent male chefs, you know, making very derogatory comments about women, about pregnant women, and it's silence from the industry, and also more worryingly, silence from prominent female chefs, which is a huge issue. I wouldn't have wanted my daughter to go into a kitchen if I had just seen the side that most people see, which is what you see in media, what you read in stories about aggression, about sexual harassment. This is a huge problem. And I don't, and of course that a culinary school cannot change that, but we can make a difference by actually talking about how, you know, these are our students, this is the ethos, and we want to change the industry because there is no point nurturing and nourishing a generation of potential chefs and then throwing them into the garbage because that is what a lot of kitchens are. And I have spoken out a lot. So anyone who has read stuff like me, I have always, always called it out. And it is deeply problematic because as a lawyer, I can tell you one thing if that kind of touching without consent happened outside a kitchen, that male chef would have been in jail. But somehow it happens in kitchens and this excuse that it is a pressured environment. I have an all-female kitchen, we have 15 people. No one touches each other in aggression. 
If you can't deal with the pressure, you get out of the kitchen. There's a mental health issue here as well. Yeah, pressure yeah. is justified in kitchen. So I think that there is a huge problem. We do not attract people because we are not attractive. As an industry, we can be incredible. We are the healers and the feeders. And as someone who is an immigrant who came to London, and I say this all the time, that you know, I may not have been able to open an all-female restaurant in Calcutta where I grew up, but I can in London. And London belongs to me, I belong to London. And I'm very proud of the umbrella and the shelter London has given me. I mean, when I opened my restaurant in, um, <laughs> it seems like a lifetime away, which was in December, I had Sadiq coming to the opening. I had Lord Villamoria, who's the head of CBI. They, everybody turned up for the opening of my restaurant because they understand that this is significant. You need to celebrate those who are Londoners who have made it through. And it is very, very important to get these stories out. And I, I know that, you know, you mentioned Netflix. I was so excited when I realized that I was going to be the first British chef on Netflix, not for myself, but for the fact that maybe Londoners would look at me. And this is why I filmed. I could have filmed anywhere. I, you know, I didn't film in Monarch Palace. I filmed in, you know, in Wembley and I went on the streets of London. I went to Billingate's Market because I wanted people to see this is what London is. This is the opportunities you have. I think it's really important because it's, no one actually sees what it is really to be in hospitality. They see the worst side. The underbelly is often what is celebrated in television. And that is a nightmare. We've got a question here about um, you know, how, how will or how could uh, London's cookery schools, uh, catering colleges and so on, work better with em employers? And I th perhaps I'll start with you, Gary. And I'm, I think I'm right in saying that actually the number of apprenticeships um, in, in this sector has, has gone down despite the apprenticeship levy. Um, and it's a bit of a sort of gripe, isn't it, that you, that you sometimes hear from employers that, uh, that the, the colleges aren't teaching um, the learners the, the, the right skills. I mean, are we getting it right? How can we get it better? Um, and, and why are apprenticeships falling? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a good question. I think, um, I think that apprenticeship question is, is, is a far, far wider piece to answer, but essentially because uh, there, are, there are numerous issues around the apprenticeship framework uh, or, or standards that we have, uh, and uh, also around the levy and uh, so on and so on. However, um, as uh, you know, London's biggest uh, provider of culinary apprenticeships currently, um, you know, our apprenticeship system is working well because it's working alongside those institutions and employers that really, really want to set an example. Um, and as, as Asma has, has just eloquently said, you know, you know, to create a profession. We're not an industry, we're a profession. And you need to start to use that language um, in order to, to promote ourselves and to show ourselves in a different way to, to a wider audience. And I think that you know, going back to, to how we can work closer with the industry, it really is working with you know, the Royal Academy of Culinary Arts, the Institute of Hospitality, Craft Guild of Chefs, the Worshipful Company of Cooks. You know, these people or these, these associations have real vested interest in, in their own uh, industry uh, partners and in education as well. And if we can then marry that up with some of the other food areas that Claire looks after and, and works alongside so that we have a true melting pot of culinary, hospitality and food professions, um, working alongside education so that we can look at research, that we can start to look at, you know, those, those, those really uh, important aspects of what does it take to turn a student into a strong professional employee that can really, really make a difference in the food industry that they choose to work in. And that's what it's all about. So it's working closely with these institutions just to ensure that we know what the employer needs and what do our students need to make a really, really strong impact. Brilliant. Um, Claire, one sort of thing which features quite large in the report we haven't talked about much yet is really strengthening London's sort of capacity for food research and innovation. You know, I mean, it's food makes such an important contribution to you know, our, our carbon emissions and obviously there's a huge public health challenges and, and so on. I mean, you know, I'm particularly mindful of this when London, when, when um, Britain has played such an important role in developing the vaccine for, 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 COVID, for COVID. But we, I don't, I mean, is it right to say we just don't really have, you know, that, that, that research and innovation capacity to the um, same degree? 
Actually, there's been a lot of uh, finance available for research around these issues recently. So Imperial bid, there've been a number of big bids looking at that. I, I was just reading a comment that someone said what we what we have a lack of is true is people that want to study food science. So food manufacturing, we have a lot of kind of opportunities in those roles um, and not so many people going into them. But there is a lot of, there is or my understanding, because I've been invited to be a part of a number of bids, a lot of funding available for research and innovation within food. And there have been some bids from Imperial, quite a few bids recently. Um, I think, but what I, what I think is really interesting, and, and LAFIC, for example, who've had their, their funding from the GLA and from um, the EU on product development. But I think, thinking about Gary and while Gary and Asma are saying, and the, the, the good point about being a good employer, and what we mean by a good employer is someone who is the um, Sustainable Restaurant Association description, you know, we've got to have flexible working, we have to have good wages, we have to have progression. So I think there's something about identifying working with good employers, just as Gary suggests. But I was doing a piece of work um, at the beginning of the year looking at incubating new food businesses, and it's not dissimilar. And, and how, where does a food business get support? And where's that pathway? And I'll give you the example of the kind of local food business course that we ran. And then there were that someone progressed to a LAFIC course, which was about getting their product into supermarket or somewhere. And then and related to that, they got a trading opportunity at Borough Market, which gave them worldwide exposure. Now, that's a perfect example of a pathway that links with a really good employer that uses innovation. And, and I think I th so I, I think this so I think there is whether there's enough research and innovation resources there, I think the universities would say absolutely no. But are we connecting with what is there? I would say no. I think we don't connect it with business incubation enough. That was probably one of the only examples that I found where you could take someone from a local training opportunity to a international kind of funded um, development opportunity with a university to an to a high profile trading opportunity well that's the we need a parallel we that only exists in one route in london so we need that everywhere in every borough and we need a parallel for this and uh, resulting in in opportunities with really really good employers and just just going back to that apprenticeship um point we looked at the, a lot of this at the gla with that disconnect between uh, what's what's available for an apprenticeship and meeting the employer's need, but also there was a lot around employer understanding of apprenticeship and the opportunity. And it, it takes there aren't the resources aren't invested in, I, I think, in that program enough to really help overcome those barriers. So there's no question we need national government um, in, more investment in this. And of course, that, that has become a sort of big big aspect of you know universities both in London and beyond is is uh, you know, supporting. The enterprise of their students and 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 and, and researchers, um, helping them to develop and commercialise, you know, their their discoveries, their their innovations, which I think again something that a London College of Food might do. And Asma, there's a, there's, there's a question here um, from Maha uh, Ajahn, um, uh, who has been set up um, a British Bangladeshi um, a, a, a sort of a cafe working with British Bangladeshi women, and she says we've well, he, she says we've struggled to get training appropriate for the women. They're skilled home cooks, but need support to get to the professional level. How would you propose centre the centre help such women? So you, have, you know, what what sort of support and, and, and training would you offer? That, that, that well, the thing is that you know I, I have done this informally um, for a long time from the time that I started. The one thing is that obviously. Uh, there is, you know, we have absolutely staggering uh, low number of women from the Somalian community, from the Pakistani community, from Bangladeshi community in employment, but all of them can cook. And one of the things that was the big change, life changer for, for me is when I realized I set up an entire restaurant, we're in the Michelin Guide, and it is run by housewives. The average age is 50. They have never ever worked in a professional kitchen. They've never attended a single course. Some of them are not educated. So there is a huge difference. And I am the one person who can tell you it is absolutely possible. And there is, there is a different technique of training, which I am doing all the time. So a lot of businesses I've set up, a lot of restaurants today are there where I've actually trained that entire staff and the owner on how to set it up. It's not because we, you know, I, I have a PhD in law. That's a different kind of structural way of thinking. But I have also set up an all-female house cooks, you know, uh, you know, in the Michelin Guide. I'm in Covent Garden, a great two-listed building. So there are, the skills are actually very different. So the thing is that not a, a college may not be able to provide that unless that you hire people in who are on the same wavelength. 
This is not about ethnicity and culture and language and education. It is about the skills that you have because for so long, for too long, women like me, who look like me, who sound like me, have never been credited as being talented. Because why is it that in every Indian, South Asian home you go to, in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, you find a woman cooking. In every South Asian restaurant you go to, it is a male cooking. So we, have, we don't know that we can do it. And the biggest thing is it is about the mindset. And you know, uh, once we can actually have people in, I'm setting up a mentoring school. In fact, that was why both picked me in the 25 people for 2020. I'm actually just mentoring women, changing them. I don't want to teach women how to run restaurants. I want to teach you how to lead, to actually believe that you can do it. So in the food business, a lot of it is we all have the skills. And you know, people have asked me that, you know, how do you work in an unprofessional kitchen? And I just don't even answer that question. Because the badge of being unprofessional is something women is put on women. And we carry it around us for life, thinking this is what we are. We are not professional chefs. We are not professionals. And this is, you know, and I think that there is definitely space for people like us, you know, like the person who asked the question, in this culinary school and being trained, not because we need to be educated or need to be taught anything, but there is this about changing the way that we think about ourselves. Yeah. A lot of it is to do with that. We are absolutely losing out on a huge half the population, females who cook, are not in, in the right business. Brilliant. They should be professionals cooking in yes. restaurants. Okay. But you go into any we're, restaurant, you'll find us. We're almost out of time. So I'm just going to ask you all uh, one question to end with and a brief response. But, but how do you think um, you know, COVID has, has changed the, 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 the context? I mean, both, both in terms of you know, strengthening skills, but, but more generally for, 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 for this sector. Because uh, yeah, there's a sim simple view which, which we wrestled with a bit, which was, oh well, it's just going to be a lot smaller and a lot less significant. And why are we worrying about um, <laughs> skills and things like that? Um, uh, Asma, do you just want to sort of a few lines on how, how you think that the, the sector will be different after COVID? I think definitely there's a huge impact. A lot of places have closed, a lot of chains have closed, and there's definitely going to be a reset in the entire profession uh, in hospitality. The whole point is that when we come back, I hope we come back humbler, kinder and less arrogant and more open to diversity and especially having more women on. So I hope that the COVID works in our favor, that we actually come back a kinder and more humble uh, industry than we were before COVID. Brilliant. Claire? Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm more opt. I mean, I think I'm very optimistic and I'm seeing a huge, huge number of new food business starting up, really exciting, interesting food business starting up. I think there's been a real valuing of the food industry, maybe not by central government, but the way the food industry has rallied and supported its community from Hawksmoor to every every restaurant that I know that's gone out and supported with community meals, with with their stock we get calls all the time when something closes to redistribute surplus it's been a mammoth i think the the food industry is and the hospitality industry has been exemplar in the way it's supported people through this crisis and and i think there will be a huge growth and i think there's been a um a real interest in local sustainable i think there's more interest in really um how important food is to our health. We did have the publication of the obesity strategy hastened by how ill our prime minister got because of his diet. So, you know, I mean, whether that people, people remember that, but I hope that will have an impact on our industry. And um, so I'm positive. And I think, I think those nine missions for London will be really relevant and they really offer opportunities for the food industry, but it will, no question we're going to lose loads isn't you know and there and people have had rent holidays until March you know there's been the rent um, and then in April when people have to pay back a year of rent I think we're going to see we're going to lose loads but I think people will I think there'll be a a massive increase in the number of new food businesses. Fascinating, fascinating. Gary last from you how do you expect COVID to change change the scene? Um, I think a lot of people are a lot more interested now in sustainability, uh, where their food comes from. Uh, they're interested in their diets and their health as well. Uh, we've done a lot of work around our culinary medicine programs uh, and uh, done a lot of research in our, in our food labs as well at, at Westminster in order to try to, to push this, this concept. Um, I hope that, uh, that uh, the people will remain 
um, interested in sustainability, in food wastage as well. Um, and uh, to, you know, this will be something that uh, the hospitality profession will then need to consider uh, and to answer to when they bounce back. It is inevitable that hospitality will bounce back. I have absolutely no doubts about that. We're a resilient bunch uh, and we will bounce back from this. But it gives us an opportunity to just realign ourselves and maybe go through a little bit of a reinvention as well to face the future and to face a lot of the aspects that the general public are really worried about now. And, and that's all of the green issues. Uh, that's the, uh, the carbon footprint uh, and, and everything that's centralized around that. So we need to answer to that too. Um, yeah. Excellent. No doubt that we will we'll bounce back. Excellent. Well, I'm sure we'll bounce back back as well. Um, and it's really encouraging to hear all of your uh, optimistic um, views. I suppose what, what strikes me is that we might well bounce back and rather to our surprise find that we don't have um, the, the workforce there. And Jonathan Porter's um, just published something uh, this week, I think it was, or was it end of last week, showing um, that London's population might have fallen by as many as 900,000 people. Um, you know, for, for not all nationally, is that national economy? A phenomenal statistic, and of course, many of those will be, I suspect, um, from the sectors which were hardest hit by by COVID, like the hospitality sector. Um, so, I, I think we'll need, in some ways, to strengthen our vocational uh, or our food training now more than ever, and and we will want a government and a, and a mayor that really supports the, the 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 food sector. And what better way of doing it than? Um, getting behind uh, a London College of, of Food. We really very much hope that we can work uh, with, with the, the three of you, um, with our advisory board, um, with all the audience today and with our sponsors as we, as we take this forward. We, we at Centre for London want to remain engaged. We want to be helpful where, where we can. Um, it remains for me to thank um, you, Claire, Asma and, and Gary for your contribution, Mario and, and Nikki, Nico Bossetti for their great work um, on the report. Um, and to our, our funders, the Mark Leonard Trust, the Stanley Foundation, the Story Charitable Trust, the City of London Corporation, and Claridge's at, and Soho House. I am, I'm leaving Centre for London at the end of the next week, but Centre for London is not going anywhere. Um, so do uh, keep an eye out for our, our upcoming events and research. Sign up to our newsletter, follow us on Twitter. Um, if you're interested in funding Centre for London Project, please do um, get in touch. Uh, thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you.